Hey everyone, today we are tackling a uh, topic that has been requested many, many times. As you guys know, we do a lot of rock cutting on the channel, and I also do a lot of jewelry making and stuff like that. Well, one question I get a lot is how do I decide where to place my cuts? So, today is Cut Placement 101. So, I picked out some rocks that we're going to be going through today, and as we go and cut through them, I, I will break down how you tackle each scenario. So, let's just take a look at the rock. How do we decide where to place our cuts on rock? Short answer is, uh, it is different for every single rock. Not only does it vary from rock to rock, it also varies uh, depending on what your plan is for said rock. For example, a rock you're cutting for a specimen or to polish will be cut differently than a rock you are cutting for jewelry. So here's some examples. We're mostly going to be focusing on agates, jasper, and petrified wood today. So let's just grab a random example. This is it's a Montana agate. It's gonna be really pretty. It's got great color, nice quartz pocket, banding. So with a rock like this, whether you want slabs or a slab spec or a polished specimen, like faced specimen, why was that so hard to say? Regardless of which way you want to go with this rock, the ideal scenario is gonna be cutting it this way because it will lead to the maximum yield and capture the best banding pocket. You could do it this way or this way, but the result isn't gonna be as good as if you just come in and get that money pocket. Conversely, a rock like this that has a lot going on inside of it, this is a Jasper, there's not really a wrong answer. <laughs> These are more forgiving when it comes to cut placement because uh, pretty much no matter how you cut it, it's probably gonna look the same. So the question there becomes more of how big do you want your slabs to be? And sometimes you have rocks like this where um, the rock itself is gonna tell you how it wants to be. We've got a nice flat face here, Nice flat face here, and it actually has color bands that go from top to bottom. It's more orange than red, then there's a chalcedony cap on top. So it's kind of already perfect to, to come clamp it like this and just slab that face. <laughs> so in that instance, that rock told you what to do. Another example of not having to worry too much is petrified wood. A lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time, doesn't really matter. You can go end grain or you can go lengthwise, the slabs are probably gonna look the same, <laughs> or at the very least, very similar. End grain cuts are nice because they're more stable, but they often are way smaller. So if you're looking for bigger results, it might be best to come in and cut it this way instead. Of course, that rule doesn't apply to agatized wood, which can look radically different. So it needs to be, uh, you know, inspect it a little bit more. Sometimes you have rocks like this, where I don't want to slab off of this rock, I just want to face it. So all we're gonna do with this rock is load it in just enough to shave the tip of that rock off. That way we get a nice flat face and I can come back and polish it at a later date. The other one would be geodes. If you can see into the geode, that is ideal because then you can come in and inspect what way you want to be you know, exposed the best. This is a piece of agonized coral from our good friend Derek. So you can see there's a, a really cool formation on this side. I don't want to cut through that, so we're going to literally just cut it right down the middle like that. Of course, they won't always tell you what they want, like that one. Sometimes you can tell it's a geode, but you can't really see very well inside of it. In that case, you kind of just cut and hope for the best. Probably going to go up this way. All right, so there is the 10,000 foot view on cut placement and the thought process that goes through how I place cuts. So. For the rest of this video, we're gonna just take rocks, I'm gonna cut them, and we'll go through how to actually position them to get the best results. I think we're gonna start with this one. All right, so my goal for this rock is slab. It has really nice color, so I think we're gonna get some good slabs. So you see I loaded it up this way, which is gonna be the best way to get that whole banding pocket, as well as the quartz lined up. And I'm gonna come in right there first, I think. All right, see what we get. All right, and that one is done. As you can see, we got what I like to call maximum yield. Even though that rock is pretty thin, we got pretty much the biggest slabs that are physically possible off of that rock. And it is beautiful, and I'm very happy with how that came out. Oh my gosh, that is so pretty. And as I showed in the last video, if we want to, we can glue this down to a board to come get the rest of the slabs off of that rock. Like this. So from here, you can come in and trim these slabs down farther to identify uh, specific spots that you want to turn into cabochons. I don't see any in this rock that I want to, but that's where you'd like, say uh, this little corner right there. Say I wanted to make a cabochon out of that, I'd just come back and cut the rest of it. 
Real easy. I think we're gonna do this big Bear Canyon agate next. I think it's gonna be a nice geode. I have no idea how deep it goes, but I think it's gonna be a good one. So let's go load this in. All right, and now we've got this loaded in. As you can see, the blade is right here. So I think we're gonna intersect with the widest part of that pocket. But if not, we can flip it 90 degrees and cut it again. All right, the geode is done, and that is a very cool result. So I'm glad I cut it where I did because it actually doesn't go that much deeper as you can see. But man, we get up close. There are so many dog tooth calcite crystals in there. There's actually some big ones down in the bottom. Really, really pretty, but I think the other side is actually better. So this was the outside. That was the little pocket that we could see into, sorry. And yeah, that is a little bit awesome. <laughs> Got all the calcite in there. Sitting on top of a bed of druzy. That is really cool. Focus please, there we go. That is just beautiful. So that's yellow calcite with tips of aragonite. Which is really, really awesome. Again, sitting on top of druzy, which is just that much cooler. Oh, that's so pretty. You know, while we're on Bear Canyons, I think I'm gonna cut this one next. So this may just look like a lumpy nothing. If I take some oil and get this pocket right here wet, I believe that is gonna be a nice fortification pocket that probably continues this way. Let's get up close. Yeah, that is gonna be a nice pocket. You can see those fortification bands. But again, this one's a weird shape, so Hmm, how do we want to cut this? I think I'm going to try to face this because the problem with big fortification agates is they're really not great for jewelry because uh, you cut up the fortification pocket. They're great for face polishing for specimens though. So I think I'm going to load this up in a way where we can cut like right here. The other thing about Bear Canyons is they don't like being slapped. They are very brittle. As you probably saw in the last one, there's lots of fractures throughout the whole thing. So if you try slapping, you're probably just going to wind up with shrapnel. So all right, uh, let's go load this up and see if I can load it the way I want to. All right, I think I've got it loaded the way I want to. That is going to be coming through right about here. All right, here's that one, and I'd say that is a fantastic result. But here's the side we could already see. Nice fortification pocket on there. And yeah, there is some really nice stuff going on in there that is very, very, very pretty. And then here's the other side. Looks like it actually opened up into a quartz pocket, which is really cool. And we even got some nice black and white fortifications over here. I love these agates so much, especially when you cut them open. There is just so much going on in there. So next, I think we're gonna cut this waterline agate. Now, there's a couple ways you can go about cutting waterline agates. In fact, one sec. There, I went and grabbed the other one. Waterline agate, waterline agate. There's two different ways you can go about cutting a waterline agate. You can uh, take the banding rule and cut it like this. That way you capture the best pocket. It shows all of the water lines. But with Montana agates, I'm sure this applies to other agates as well, but with Montana agates, one of the best ways to get nice, mossy, beautiful scenes is instead of cutting this way to capture the banding, you cut this way to capture individual layers in between the water line. As you can see on that bottom face, there is some phenomenal moss on that side, and that's true for most Montana waterline agates. Some of the best moss is trapped in between those layers. So one of the best ways to get really good material for jewelry is cutting it in a way where you can go in between the layers. So how about I demonstrate both ways? We'll do this one second. There's a reason I picked this rock, and that's because this is a good example of <laughs> needing to troubleshoot. Usually life is good, and you know, you're cutting rocks that are like this, where they're pretty uniform in shape, and it's, it's gonna be easy to get the best result. Here's <laughs> what happens a lot of times, though is you'll get a wonky shaped rock like this that does not um, lend itself very well to cut the way you want to. So for example, like we just said, with this one, we're gonna cut it so that we can capture the water line, which means we need to come in at this level, but there's not really <laughs> much to hold on to there. So we could come in on this side that should grip a little better in the clamp and it would lead to smaller slabs, but a better result, I think. There, you can see we've got that loaded up. I think the best way to capture all of those faces. So I'm gonna take this back a little bit, uh, quite a bit. All right, that should be good. So let's start getting some slabs. Also, also, if I'm cutting a Montana agate that has good banding, regardless of what my end goal is, I will always cut one thin slab because you never know what is gonna turn into an iris. All right, water line number one is done. As you can see, we captured that water line perfectly. Those water levels look very good. 
and it is a really pretty slab. Well, slabs, uh, plural. This works great for this kind of waterline because there wasn't really any mossy stuff going on in there anyway. So now, let's just move on to the second variety, which is gonna be this way. And I wanna cut it so we can capture the spaces in between the layers. Probably load it like this so that we can cut like this. All right, we've just experienced our next common issue that has to be overcome. And that is, I wanna load it like this, but there's not enough for it to grip. It won't clamp down on that because every time I tighten it, it's just gonna pop the rock out. So to get around this, there's two options. You can either glue it to a board and then slab it the other direction, which is fine, that works great. Uh, I don't wanna do that because I don't feel like waiting. Trying to get this video done in a timely fashion. So instead, we're gonna come in like this, slab just the edge to flatten the edge, and then that will give this side more room to grip once we flip it back around. See, now that I've flattened the edges, now I can actually come in and cut it the way I want to right along those water lines. All right, and here is the other one. You capture way more dendrites by coming in and cutting them this way. And that is ideal for finding stuff that's gonna be good for making cabs. Here's the next one. Probably a few scenics in here somewhere. I love this pocket up here though, that is so pretty. Lots of red staining up here, which is really, really cool. But yeah, you can see how cutting it at a different angle changes the result drastically. Get a very different result doing it that way. And there's more of this rock left, quite a bit actually. So I can come back glue it to a board and get the rest of it if I feel like it. I think next we're gonna move on to this one. I picked this agate specifically because it's a weird shape, should cut fine, but there's no obvious answer. So normally when I'm cutting a rock, I am looking for things like banding, moss, flumy stuff, you know, that kind of stuff. So I know which way to angle my cuts. This rock doesn't really show anything on the outside. <laughs> you can see some plumy stuff on this side, but I don't see any banding that is like targetable. So what I do in this situation is I go get it soaked in some oil so that I can see deeper into it. Even if you are using a saw that runs water, I would highly recommend keeping a little bottle of mineral oil nearby because it helps so much when it comes to identifying properties of a rock that you want to cut. So I'm seeing a lot of plumy stuff on the backside. I'm seeing some banding on this side, some moss on this side. So after investigating, I don't see any one side that looks like it's gonna be better than the other. So because of that, I think I wanna cut it this way to get this face. Because I think this is gonna show the best of all worlds, because we'll be getting this plume down at the bottom. I think there's gonna be some bands in there and we might get some some moss deeper in there. Sometimes there isn't an answer, <laughs> you know? Like that, you know, those banded ones. It, it tells you it wants to be cut along the banding, but sometimes you get a rock like this where it's like, eh, doesn't really make a difference which way we cut it. All right, well I just did what I call an investigation cut. I don't really call it that. Well, I guess I just did. That was just to cut a heel off so I could see what we're gonna wind up with. And it looks like that is gonna be a pretty way to go. I'm not seeing much bands yet, but I am seeing turtle backs, which is pretty cool. Some, that plumy stuff is starting up here. So yeah, I think I am gonna move forward on that axis. And it is done. It really is a pretty unique agate. That has some really, really cool turtle backs. See that rolling texture? There is some banding. It's really fine though. More turtle backs, some banding, and some moss on that one. Other half is really, really pretty. Plumy stuff up there. Dendrites down here. Bit of color right there. Banding and turtle backs. So yeah, I'd say that was a good call. Oh, I did, I'm just now noticing that. Truzy pocket in here, <laughs> that's awesome. This is gonna be next on the chopping block. So when it comes to petrified wood, usually it doesn't really matter if I'm being honest. Not the petrified wood, it matters. It's just the way you, anyway. anyway. Take this piece for example. Whether we cut it this way, this way, this way, or this way, all of those results are pretty much gonna look the same. Distinction comes in with, are you going to cut it lengthwise or end grain wise? And again, that comes down completely to personal preference. It really makes no difference. <laughs> Except on pieces like this. This is some extremely agonized wood. Very, very solicitated. This is wood that solicits. You can see some of that grain on the outside there. I have found with this stuff that the best result you get usually comes from cutting it with the end grain. So I'm gonna load it up so that we can cut it this way because you can see the grain right in here. And I'm hoping for good results. This is really, really pretty agonized wood. So it should be nice. Look at that glow. Look at that glow. All right, that is beautiful. So you know how this just kind of looked like a roughly wood resembling rock? Yeah, that is stunning. That is so freaking pretty. You can see that 
wavy wood grain up here. There's even some moss in there. That is really, really pretty. But wait, it gets better. Look at that. <laughs> That is flipping gorgeous. And that's why when it comes to agonized wood, I like to cut the end grain, because that is something else. All right, so next we're gonna do this Jasper. And I picked this Jasper for a specific reason. And that is, it is, it's a one that yields multiple results depending on how you go with it. Here's what I mean by that. So this beautiful swirly pattern continues all the way around, all the way around, but Here's the thing, it has zones of color. So we've got an area of red over here, there's an area of kind of a greenish color on the back, more red, a little bit of yellow, and some brown up top. So if we cut it this way, on this axis, we're gonna capture all of the zones. If we cut it this way, see right there, this slab right here would look completely different than this slab right here, because we're basically gonna catch all that red in one spot. So again, just like a lot of these, it just comes down to personal preference. Do you want zones or do you want to get as much of all of it in one go as you can? I think I'm more inclined to try to get as much of it as I can, which means we are gonna wanna cut it either this way or end grain. But I think this way will yield the biggest slabs. And I definitely wanna get as much of this rock as I can because this thing is really freaking nice. <laughs> Look at that plumey pocket up there. Hey, it's almost like we just did a plume video. Alrighty, so we've got it loaded in, nice and square. Means we're gonna be coming in this way and getting the largest slabs possible. Alrighty, that is done. With the way we loaded it, we got the best of all worlds. There's like plumey stuff down in the bottom. Got some of that red and plumey stuff. Beautiful wispy bands through that thing. That's beautiful. Again, loading it the way we did, we got the best of all worlds. There's even a little bit of green on that one. That was taking for freaking ever. So um, I'm gonna cut the rest of this later when I have my new blade, because I don't feel like cutting any more of that. This is a much harder, denser rock than it looks. Alrighty. Well, I think we are gonna end with this agate right here. I say this all the time, these dark Montana agates there's really not very little knowing what the heck you're gonna find on the inside until you actually get into it. So this could be something incredible, it could be meh, it could be average, like I, I, there's no knowing what we might find in here. And unfortunately, because of that, it's kind of a crapshoot to load these things. <laughs> I think we're gonna cut it on this face right here. So, let's load it up. All right, Agate, turn into something wondrous. All right, and the last one is done. It does not look how I thought it would. That is an extremely dark agate, and there's little waterline pockets. That is pretty cool. Really, really, really mossy. So that will be a good one for cabbing, I think. You can come back and isolate all of those pockets that have good dendrites. Make some pretty cabochons out of those. Again, that just kind of drives my point home of those dark Montana agates. There's no real way of knowing what the heck you're gonna find on the inside. I really like this waterline pocket that was right on the outside of it. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Alright guys, well I think that is going to do it for this one. I hope that serves as an adequate crash course in cut placement. As I say all the time, um, this is not necessarily the correct way, it's just the way I do it and there are hundreds of ways to achieve the same goal in lapidary. <laughs> and I'm sure you've all heard me say this many times before, but generally speaking, a rock will tell you how it wants to be cut. Finding it hard to believe that it's actually real, but the snow is finally melting out there. So I'm hoping we can go rock hunting soon. It's not even the temperature I'm waiting on. It's just exposed gravel. The second there's some exposed gravel, I am on it. Let me know which rock we cut today was your favorite. Honestly, mine's probably this geode. That cal Those calcite crystals are phenomenal. Also, also, uh, every rock follows very different 
uh, set of rules when it comes to cutting. So I picked these ones today because they're similar. Agates, Jasper, Petrified Wood follow the same criteria, generally speaking, but something like Labradorite is completely different. So if you guys would like a Labradorite creature feature, let me know. I'll have links to various things and also whatnot in the description. But yeah, that's gonna do it for this one. I hope you all enjoyed and I'll see you next time. <sighs> wow, that was a one day start to finish video. I cannot remember the last time that happened.